Hello, I'm Matthew Weinstock, Managing Editor of Modern Healthcare. Thanks for tuning in to the latest edition of The Checkup. As public health departments across the country shut down their mass vaccination sites and we start to shift attention to sort of more personalized and one-on-one -on -one approaches to ensuring people get their COVID vaccines, we're still seeing hesitancy out there, obviously. Experts are saying that primary care providers and community partnerships and other more personalized approaches should and can play an integral role in this effort. I'm really pleased today to be joined by Dr. Georges Benjamin. He's executive director of the American Public Health Association, but he's also co-lead of Get My Rx, a national task force that's aimed at doing a number of things, but particularly trying to build confidence in the vaccine efforts and building out local partnerships. Dr. Benjamin, thank you so much for being with us to talk about this important topic. Thanks for having me today. So let's start before we delve into some of the things that primary care doctors and others can do to get engaged. Why don't you tell us a little bit about Get My Rx and what efforts you guys have been doing out there in the in the field? Well, this is a coalition um, that got together because we were very much concerned about the fact that there was just so much vaccine hesitancy, and um, we just really didn't see enough of the effort on the uh, at the grassroots that we wanted to have early on. Um, and there are, as you know, there are reasons for that. And so we got together in a multi-sectorial kind of way to talk about what was needed and then to put out a series of recommendations that are really focused on bringing in all of the aspects of our, of our health sector and our community as a way of, of getting more people vaccinated. And so, you know, I think one of the things we've seen with hesitancy is at the beginning, um, there was certainly a focus on populations of color and the hesitancy there. Now more data is coming out that it's, you know, breaking out rural, urban, even along party affiliation lines. How does that kind of uh, change in what we're seeing in the vaccine push impact the kind of messaging you need to put out there? Well, it, it tells us that you have to not only be clear about the message because there are various groups that have different messages that work better, but also about the messenger. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have to try to normalize vaccination in, in our country. It's become, as you said, a political football. And until we normalize it as something, yeah, it's cool to do and we should do it because it, it protects grandma, but it also protects me, we're not going to get there. Why do you think that we're in this particular position with COVID? I mean, we, we don't necessarily, we see it with other vaccines, obviously, but like the flu, we don't see this much hesitancy around a vaccine like that. Well, I think that there are a lot of factors here. Obviously, um, it um, came along in a, at a time when there was a lot of hostility in the last administration around a lot of the issues. And quite frankly, they did not manage the governance of this process very, very well. Let me give them credit, though, for actually pushing the science to create the vaccines. We should all give them much credit for that. Um, but I think that the, the mixed messages played a big role. Having said that, you know, um, we know how to do this. And there clearly has been uh, an explosion of social media and places where people can get misinformation. And so we're really seeing in the vaccine effort, uh, really a societal look at a lot of things that are going on in our, in our nation, in fact, in our world. And so wh why should we be any different, yeah. unfortunately? Yeah. Well, if we step back to the beginning of the vaccine rollout, I'm, I'm curious about your your take. Was the approach the right approach to start with these large mass vaccination sites as opposed to getting um, your individual doctor, your primary care physician who, you know, study after study show that's who you trust? Should they have been more engaged at the, in the process on the front end? Um, I think that I think the strategy that we use where we where we really focus like a laser on the healthcare sector and the long-term care sector was that right approach. And that required us to um, do it in a, in a way that required you know, mass distribution. Remember that at least initially, we were very much concerned about the ability to store and distribute vaccines and the vaccines came in large lots. Now, I think there was a failure in not planning to move into physician offices and primary care practices a lot quicker than we did. In other words, we probably should have told the, the pharmaceutical companies, look, we need you to certainly put these um, vaccines in ways that you can distribute it to um, areas very quickly in large amounts, but we need to make sure we have a double track on that because the truth of the matter is your primary care doctor is the most trusted person 
uh, in the healthcare enterprise. Uh, and I don't want to offend the nurses, the nurses as well. And in the practice, um, that's the way to deliver shots in the arms to the individual patient. But also remember that a lot of practices weren't open early on. So I think the strategy was fine. Right, right. Uh, and I, I'm curious too, from your perspective, you know, so many people went to maybe a Walgreens or a CVS to get their shot or one of the public county mass vaccination sites. You know, the challenge of figuring out who actually got their shot is has become a problem, I'd imagine, for public health professionals, correct? It continues to be an issue. Um, but, you know, you have a card and you can go in and show that card. And, and obviously that's that's your your documentation. But I got to I got to tell you that this is really a representation of our the dysfunction in our healthcare system. The fact that it's so fractured, the fact that our IT and data systems um, are um, not linked. There's not uh, in connectivity between the public health system and the healthcare system. Those are the kinds of problems that we have because in health systems where they have an electronic medical record, they had connectivity you know, a Kaiser, a Geisinger, places like that, some of these integrated health systems, uh, they did not have those kinds of problems with, with um, you know, knowing um, who was vaccinated and making sure people got their second shot. Yeah, it's a, I, I got mine at a, at a retail pharmacy, but I still get notices from my uh, physician practice, you know, about getting the shot. So there's not that connection that, that that's existed right. yet. Um, so talk a little bit about the strategy that at Get My Rx and, and what other things you see working in the industry, in the field to get primary care uh, and physicians more engaged? What are some of the tactics that you find are really working well? Well, we talked a lot about bringing in community and doing this at the community level and engaging physician practices in particular um, as part of that collective uh, because they know their patients, they know the community and talking with them and trying to get them more involved. We want to encourage that the federal government would um, reach out more aggressively and state government as well to making sure that uh, physician practices had the uh, medications and access to the, uh, to the vaccine. Uh, and then providing them with all the resources that they need to uh, again, account for not only the vaccine, but um, put their patients in a system. Now I'm in Maryland and eventually my, my doctor was able to do that, but it was, yeah. it was a piece of work for them. They first said, you know, he got vaccinated as part of the hospital because he does long-term care work and was on the medical staff. But there are other physicians who were, quite frankly, not linked to the health system who, by the way, some of them are still not linked into the system. And is there uniform messaging that you're seeing that works um, across the board for these physicians? Well, I think, um, first of all, we've encouraged physicians to make sure that a, they, they're vaccinated and that their office staff uh, are vaccinated. And then of course, they should use their um, prestige and trust to encourage all their patients get vaccinated. But remember that on any given day, they're gonna vaccinate you know, four or five people uh, in, a, in an at-risk population. You know, They're not gonna do 40 patients. And if you're a family practitioner um, or you have a, a practice includes kids and, and um, adolescents, you know, you're only gonna be doing those folks that are age 12 and above. So I think the real challenge we had was making sure that we could get lots of vaccine in the 10 and 20 range versus the 1000 range for clinical practices. And that was a logistical problem that the system had, not one that physicians weren't eager to, to vaccinate their patients. And by the way, their patients, you know, were, were eager to get vaccinated. Right, right. I want to make sure I, I understand too. I think get my RX. You're working with some employer groups around trying to spread the message of vaccine. Is that right? We are, and we're, we're definitely encouraging employers to do a couple things. Number one, um, encourage their patients, you know, their employees, to talk with their physicians, talk with their healthcare providers, to make sure that they um, get their their health taken care of in a holistic way. And part of that is getting vaccinated and obviously getting vaccinated for COVID. And then, you know, we have patients out there who have a range of chronic medical conditions um, or women who may have questions about um, the appropriateness of getting vaccinated. The science says that they should all be vaccinated, but they have questions. And so the, the, um, our coalition is working to make sure that employers know that they should make sure that their patients, um, their, their employees get linked 
to their clinicians uh, and to their medical practices. Uh, also by giving them paid time off. We encourage paid time off um, in order to allow people to um, go to their doctors. How hard do you still feel like you're fighting that science argument on it that you know the, these vaccines were rushed through the process, um, that maybe they're not safe? Is that still resonating? Is that still something you've got to combat? Yeah, we still have to combat that every day because um, you know the, the the difference today about this process was that this vaccine development process was done in a fishbowl. Now I think that's wonderful for transparency. But we did not prepare the public, I think, the way we should have. So, for example, people think that we magically decided we were going to do these vaccines for the first time um, a year ago in February. Well, that was not the case. These vaccines have been in development because of the first SARS outbreak mm -hmm. for almost you know, 19 years. And so we almost had a vaccine for SARS-1. So people knew that, as I call it, the little spiky thing on the virus was a part of the virus that made um, your body react. And as you know, that many of the challenges that you have in vaccine development is figuring out what part of the virus causes the body to react. Well, we already knew that. And then we have been doing work on mRNA vaccines for many years for other diseases. And so they had some ideas on where they needed to go. And I think the, the really neat part of this was they were able to identify the genetic structure of this virus very, very quickly. And that is science that has been years in the making. So when you put all that together, it was the coming together of, in essence, what we kind of say a, a Sputnik moment, where all the right parts of the scientific equation came together and they were able to get it and take it and run with it. Now, the communication was not as comprehensive as I just explained it. And the right. public just saw, yeah, we're going to have it in 10 months. We're not sure what it's going to look like. And, you know, all of our, our concerns and fears we discussed in public, which we never usually do. Right, right. I, I'm curious too, Dr. Benjamin, in the last couple of minutes we have, we have left, um, we're seeing a lot of health systems across the country mandate vaccines for their staff. Um, a lot of the trade associations have not come out to endorse that mandate, but they're you know, sort of leaving it up to the individual hospitals and their members. What's your take on that? Well, let me tell you, I, obviously I, I think mandates are really tough, particularly the fact that the vaccine, is, while it's been fully approved by the FDA and CDC under the emergency use authorization, um, it has not yet been completely approved by the FDA at the level that, that um, it can be, um, um, be mandated in my mind. I know people are doing it. I know that uh, the feds are saying it's okay. And I support that as a physician. Uh, when I was practicing, I absolutely uh, you know, took all my shots. Uh, and I believe we should mandate you know, things like flu shot for all individuals that don't have medical contraindications to, to, the, to the shot. The medical situation is very different. The medical environment is very different than um, going to a concert. So I think yes, for healthcare workers, uh, and certain selected populations, um, but no for the rest of us, but we should vigorously encourage people to get vaccinated. It is, this vaccine is safe and effective. So once these do get full approval from the FDA, then do you think that the industry trade groups should come out and say, yeah, healthcare workers should, should take this. It should be a mandate of employment. Yeah, I think it'll be easier to, I'll be, I think it'll be easier to require it. Now, again, you know, there's lots of caveats to that. There are health reasons why some people may not be able to, um, you know, and, and I think that th those have to be dealt with on a case by case basis. But uh, but overall, eventually, I think we'll be able to get there. Okay. And, and lastly, we're seeing some spikes, obviously, in different parts of the country. Um, how worried are, are you about those spikes? And what does that do to, you know, your efforts to try to continue to ramp up this message of get a shot, get a shot, get a shot? Yeah, I'm very worried. And um, the Delta virus is now the preeminent vir um, variant that we have. And I'm worried about the Delta variant. And I, But let me tell you, the Delta variant is right now making very sick and, and almost all the people that are dying are people that are unvaccinated. So the solution to me is real clear, get, get your shot, get vaccinated. Now, having said that, I am also even more worried about the, the variant that we've not yet seen that 
occurs because it's circuit this virus is circulating in an unvaccinated population. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's not necessarily the Delta uh, variant that I'm worried about, but it's the one that we named down the road that may be homegrown that we really need to be concerned about. So a mutation of it of sorts. Uh, it'll be another mutation. I mean, the yeah. Delta variant is a mutation. It'll be another mutation. And the way you stop mutations is you get everybody vaccinated so the virus right. can't spread. Well, hopefully we won't get to that point where we have, you know, iterations of mutations coming along. Um, Dr. Benjamin, we really appreciate your time talking here today. We'd love to be able to check back in, you know, in a couple months, see how your efforts are going on the vaccination rollout and continue and talk about your messaging and how that's working. Uh, listen, I thank you very much. I enjoy being here. Thanks so much. Take care. Bye-bye. And I'm Matthew Weinstock with Modern Healthcare. Be sure to come back next Monday for another edition of The Checkup.